Well, hello. I'm Ramona, and welcome back to Ascend Legal 101. I was so excited for today's interview with Eric McCracken, who is a combat sports regulatory lawyer, lawyer and personal injury lawyer. And I just wanted to let y'all know that I was having some technical challenges and so some of my recording quality is not as good as I would uh, like it to be. So, you know, spare me the comments, I already know. And I've been honest with you since day one and that is that that technical bit is not my strong area. But I hope we're having cool, fun conversations that everybody can get into. And if you like this video and this conversation, if you're into combat sports, or MMA or any of the things that are so fun or if you're just scrappy, just a little scrappy like me, then please like, share the video and subscribe for future videos. Eric McGracken is a personal injury and ICBC claims lawyer and combative sports regulatory lawyer and is the managing partner at the law firm of McIsaac and Company in Victoria, British Columbia. His practice includes mainly plaintiff-only personal injury and class action claims, with a particular emphasis on claims involving orthopedic injuries, complex soft tissue injuries, spinal cord injuries, and brain injuries. His practice further includes navigating combative sports regulatory and other legal issues surrounding combat sports. He is a licensed judge with the BC Athletic Commission in the sports of Muay Thai, kickboxing and mixed martial arts. Eric is also a co-owner of Inspire Sports Victoria. Please help me welcome Eric McGracken. I'm so happy to be speaking with you today because when I saw your bio on LinkedIn, uh, because we, have, uh, we live in the same community and we have some of the same contacts, I saw that you were a combat sports regulatory lawyer and I thought, wow, what is that? And um, what does a combat sports regulatory lawyer do and how did you get there? Yeah, so uh, combat sports, are, are you a fan of combat sports? Do you follow any of them? I do. I actually, back in the olden days when other women didn't fight. I actually box competitively, golden oh, gloves, excellent. all that. Yeah. But it was hard to find other women. Yeah. And, and did you box uh, professionally or on the amateur circuit? Amateur. Yeah. So the, the, the only reason why I ask is because professional combat sports have a unique place in the Canadian um, legal world. So these are the only sport, I'll back it up a little bit. A lot of sports have self-regulation and they have a legal context so you have amateur sports the olympic sports national governing bodies international governing bodies uh you have the provincial bodies you have the politics involved and you have legal contracts to navigate professional combat sports are different because these are the only sports that are truly hands-on regulated government so take british columbia for example there's uh extension of government, the BC Athletic Commissioner. And that office has jurisdiction over professional boxing, over professional mixed martial arts, over professional kickboxing, which they legalized right before the pandemic, but COVID derailed all of that. And they also have jurisdiction over certain amateur sports, kickboxing, Muay Thai, mixed martial arts, those kinds of things, basically full contact sports with the exception of amateur boxing, which is largely self-regulated. And the same holds true across most of North America. So, so you go to Alberta, you go to Saskatchewan, you go to New York, you go to California, you have government entities overseeing these sports. And, and if you want to put it in a legal context, it's basically just administrative law. You have an administrative body. They're given certain statutory powers. They're given certain regulatory powers. It's a system of licensing and of regulation. And people run into problems dealing with those agents of government in combat sports just like they do in any other uh, areas of law. So all that combat sports regulatory law is, is dealing with these various athletic commissions on behalf of license holders and stakeholders that have to interact with. It's a unique area and it's a fun area to practice. Yes, and so what, what brought you there? What's your interest in combat sports? 
My, well, well, I'm I'm a long time fan of combative sports, but what brought me onto the regulatory side? It, it's probably about ten years ago. I attended just as a fan to a local kickboxing bout, and that was the first live card I went to in probably a decade. Back when I lived in New Mexico, I go to the live fights all the time, but it was it was the first time, sort of post law school, that I sat down and watched a live fight and. The lawyer in me couldn't help just sort of ask, how's this legal? I was just I was just curious about the nuts and bolts of it. Like, I don't know why my mind went there, but it did. And I started digging into it. And the short answer was, it wasn't legal. It was an outright illegal event held in broad daylight with big advertisements, you know, TV ads, the whole nine yards. And nobody cared. Nobody cared that you have this broad daylight illegal event going on. And I found that fascinating. Now, this is before the BC Athletic Commission even existed. And back then, Canada's criminal code really didn't allow any pro-combat sports to take place except for pro-boxing because of how the code is worded. But nobody cared. Across Canada, events would take place. You know, cops would show up. Uh, people in government would show up. Everybody turned a willing blind eye. And in all of my years of practicing law, I never ever interacted with an area where the law was just so brazenly skirted without anybody in power caring. So I found it fascinating. And at the same time, that's when there was a federal push to amend the criminal code to make it more expansive to allow other sports to come in. Um, it, was, it was actually the UFC that was lobbying to change the language so they could legally host MMA in Canada, even though they were already hosting MMA events in Canada. And so from there, I just sort of dorked out on it. I, I followed the federal debates and the way they structured it is they delegated power to the provinces. So I followed all of the uh, provincial governments as they regulated the sports and legalized the sports in their own sort of unique cookie cutter way. So no two provinces are identical. And so I just followed that stuff. And, and by doing so over a number of years, I just built up a certain level of expertise and there weren't a whole lot of people doing it. So from there, just a few opportunities to get involved in the sport naturally came about. Right. That's really interesting because, I mean, even back in the 90s, I mean, forever, I, ha I, ha I attended a lot of those events as well. I forget what we used to call them, but they had some catchy name. And you're right, lots of great advertising and all kinds of stuff. And I think because I came from a both a legal background, but also an amateur background, which is regulated and in its own way, I think I made the assumption that there was some regulatory control, but I guess that is, that's not the case. Yeah, so, so back then in BC, they had these municipal athletic commissions overseeing things. And, and so like, again, if you're the promoter and you want to do it by the book, you go there and you pay your fees and the city gives you whatever permits they give you. But the criminal code still said they couldn't do it. So, so even though everybody sort of kind of thought they were doing it lawfully, they weren't. And again, nobody cared. That was, to me, that was the fascinating thing is everybody's breaking the law probably without even knowing they're breaking the law. And, and so it's not even turning a blind eye. People are probably saying, hey, this is how you do it by the book. And it, you know, it takes a dork like me to sort of point out the nuances of this is why it's not on the level. But again, nobody cared. And, and for over the years, the sport transformed to there being a lawful way, you know, again, be, it, be it kickboxing or mixed martial arts or professional boxing, you could host these events legally. And now there's very clear, objective ways out of how to go about doing it. And, and there's still... The yeah, other thing, I was on a, another podcast recently and we got into it. I started my babbling thinking the criminal code would be amended and that's the end of it. And then, of course, you have these you know, provincial commissions being formed, so I followed it. But from there, there's never been a shortage of dysfunctional stories in the sport to sort of keep me going. So I always thought one day I'll be done writing about this, but it seems like week after week or month after month, something newsworthy pops up and, and there's always something worth critically analyzing in terms of how these sports are overseen and how they're regulated. That's really interesting. So you're also a personal injury lawyer and how do you combine your personal injury practice with your competitive, combative sports regulatory practice? 
Yeah, so so I've been practicing injury law basically since I was called to the bar. I, I articled at a boutique criminal law firm, and then I I went on to uh, more of a do everything kind of a firm where I dabbled in a lot of areas. And very quickly, I ended up uh, focusing, specializing in injury work. So I've done it for the better part of two decades. Um, you know, the interaction, I guess the main interaction is I can't divorce myself from knowledge of traumatic brain injury and the consequences of traumatic brain injury and the sports themselves because brain injuring your opponent is the heart of combative sports. It's a lawful way to end a fight or to win a fight. And, you know, that's, when I put it bluntly like that, it sounds terrible, but it's true. And, and I can't compartmentalize it. Like, okay, as an injury lawyer, I know this stuff is terrible and serious, but as a fight fan, rah, rah, rah. And so over the years, I've, I've probably spent a lot of time reviewing the peer-reviewed literature that comes out on sport injuries, brain injuries, and combat sports, and, and just trying to highlight the real dangers for educating people involved in the sport. Um, more than anything, um, it's, it's such a dangerous business that I don't like seeing fighters be exploited financially. I like fighters to, you know, if, if they're in a fight or in a business that doesn't make a lot of money, so be it. That's the choice they make. But, but you see it in mixed martial arts these days. Uh, promotion is worth close to $10 billion on the latest market valuation. Fighters are pocketing 16 to 18% of the revenues collectively. So they're some of the most exploited athletes out there financially in any given sport. So I like to be vocal about these issues. I like to educate people about these issues. And I like to encourage people to take collective action or even individual action to have themselves a better landscape because if you're going to be in the fight business as a fighter you better get paid as much as you can and you better have as short of a career as you can and you better be surgical about how much brain trauma you expose yourself to not only in competition but in training because uh, the end chapter of a lot of fighters careers is very, very ugly stuff. And, and so, sorry, I'm sort of rambling here, but my my injury lawyer knowledge is interwoven in terms of the lens through which I view combat sports. And so, you know, I hope I hope that answers your question. It does. And it, I, it raises a really important uh, issue about traumatic brain injury. And I think in law, you know, we see it a lot. We see it tons with our clients. And certainly when I was boxing, I didn't think about it, but I sure watched, especially the young guys, they, um, they would go hard and you could see them. I remember saying to our coaches, should we call him an ambulance? And they're like, oh, no, no, I'll be fine. And you could tell that they were, even just from sparring, clearly not, you know, there was something going on there. And I even remember one time after sparring quite hard, I couldn't, I had to write a check and I couldn't sign my name. Mm. And I thought, oh, this is a problem. And I knew that because I did criminal law, personal injury, you know, I was a paralegal. And, and so I'd seen all of that kind of stuff. And I thought, oh, this is a problem. I, you know, and, the, and I, I think as parents as well, or, you know, I think there's a lot of, um, I think there's just a lot of educating the public that we need to do about about brain injury because you, I think the certainly in the community that I was in and the people that I trained with, the attitude is, and we all know this in in these kinds of sports, is kill or be killed. Period. She who controls the center of the ring controls the fight, right? Yeah. And. And, it, you know, it's getting hit that, I mean, it's the only time you can, you just really get to hit somebody in the face a lot and you get most points for that. Yeah, no, you're right. And, and the people attracted to the sport, um, you know, sort of nature, nurture, I think you get the type of people attracted to participate in the sport in the first place. And then you get the culture sport and I think you hit the nail on the head with the word education. I would like to believe that over the years things have changed. Um, 
probably not as much as they should have. And there's always going to be a need for ongoing education, trainers, fighters themselves, regulators. There's, you know, there's a lot of places where good information could go out. Just like a lot of people attend these sports and take for granted that they're legal. I think a lot of people watch these sports and take for granted that they're relatively safe. Oh, this stuff's on TV. It can't be that bad. Oh, those guys are knocking themselves stupid. Maybe it's not a big deal if I knock myself stupid. But as you know, when you when you dig into the medical literature, it's not a nice picture, ain't it? And educating people about the realities of traumatic brain injury, uh, educating people about things like CTE and the fact that mileage matters, right? It's words you talk about that are probably the worst. Somebody, somebody put it really well. I think it was Dr. Nowitzki. That's uh, um, PhD behind the NHL, NFL brain health studies. And he's talking about football, but in boxing, it applies. It's basically 90% of the brain damage happens in training. Right. Why? You don't need it, right? Like, like you know, take boxing, you're not going to change the sport where brain injury is removed, especially from professional boxing. That's, you know, in large part, again, I hate to say it, but in large part, that's the attraction. But if you appreciate that, that's when these men and women are being paid to take the brain damage. Why are you taking it in training? Every hard punch in training better have a damn good reason because that's one of those, you know, centimeters adding up to the eventual mileage where you get to that point of no return and now you're going to have compromised brain health for the rest of your life. So people need to be educated, trained smart, to be smart in the gym, to be smart in how they fight, to be smart in terms of how many fights they have, be smart in terms of how they from concussions, be smart about when they better hang them up, and to be smart about whether they even did it in the first place, because these are dangerous choices that athletes make. These aren't, you know, these aren't sports made for everybody. And and there is room for constant education, so I don't mind being one of the voices in the mix pointing out these issues. And it's not from a perspective of hating the sport or trying to shut them down. It's from a perspective of trying to better the sport and improve a landscape for people that participate in them. So I think you touched on this a little bit earlier, but what kinds of specific regulatory matters are, are you seeing? Or so, or yeah, yeah. So the competitive sports stuff is, it's, you know, I enjoy it and I'm very vocal about it, but it's not the biggest part of my practice. It maybe makes up five, if I'm generous, 10% of the work that I do. My my day-to-day -day work is largely injury work. But on the combative sports side, I've gotten into doping issues, anti-doping issues, helping uh, fighters navigate that. I've helped fighters deal with charges, athletic commissions when they're accused of violating certain obligations that they have. I've helped people with licensing issues, helped people get out of bad management contracts. Mm -hmm. there's, there's an area that's begging for reform. I've helped fighters get out of bad promotional contracts as well. Um, and then some appellate work helping um, fighters navigate bouts being overturned or bouts that should be overturned in the very limited, limited times when you can actually do that. A lot of a lot of fighters need to appeal when they have no right to appeal, but I've gotten involved in a handful of, of those sorts of issues over the years. So, you know, it's a, it's a pretty wide variety of work that I've done, but it's not it's not a significant part of my practice. It's I take the work comes my way and to be completely candid. A lot of the work I do is completely pro bono because uh, men and women that need help have the funds to afford legal help. So be it steering people in the right direction, which I enjoy doing, or taking on uh, tasks that I'm qualified to take on. It really depends on the jurisdiction where issues arise. I'll, I'll have a lot of people in the U.S. contact me and I let them know, look, I'm not a licensed down there as much as I can steer you in the right direction or matchmake for you. Sometimes I can play the manager card or, or a commission will deal with a manager and I could be a temporary manager for a fighter and sort of get them through the back door that way. But oftentimes I'll have to steer uh, people um, to other folks and then I'll collaborate with their counsel if they could afford counsel down there. So again, it's, it's sort of a wide variety of work and you know, a wide variety of jurisdictions when people come to me with their problems and I try to help as I can. I just, I, you know, it, it's that's the fun part of your practice, I bet. I'm not saying personal injury isn't fun because it is. 
but um, you, you know, I have this podcast simply because it's for fun and I get to talk to interesting people all the time. So I can, I, I can sense your passion, uh, you know, with respect to that piece of your practice, because that's always sort of the icing, right? It's not the bread and butter. Yeah, I think, and, and this is really for any lawyers out there, I think it's important, you know, you have to be level-headed and you need, you need to put food on the table. So you have to practice in something meaningful and ideally that you enjoy because you have to do it day in, day out. But there's no harm. And I've encouraged lots of employees over the years to find the thing you love to do and do it, whether it turns into a meaningful practice or just a supplement to your practice. I think there's some sense of fulfillment professionally people get if they can do what they enjoy. And so I've got my weird interest of dabbling in combative sports legal issues. I have other lawyers that you know go down different rabbit holes. And I would love to see it. People people should do what they enjoy to the extent that they have the luxury of time to pursue those kinds of those kinds of avenues. Me too. I love that as well. And speaking of, you also own your own sports company, Inspire Sports. Can you tell me about Inspire Sports? Well, this is a fun one too. So, so it's um, it's the largest gymnastic center on Vancouver Island. I think it's the second largest in all of British Columbia. And we opened it three years ago. I'm really proud of the facility. I, I want to be clear. I'm just a co-owner. There's there's five or six of us involved in the project. And my biggest role was financing it. I helped get it off the ground because it was a pretty ambitious venture. Um, and businesses that need a lot of capital up front Banks don't always love that idea. And so I help them with a lot of the startup costs. And it, it's really a small miracle that Jim is here and not just surviving, but thriving after the pandemic because there's no business that's better situated to fail. 20,000 square foot plus gym opening about a year before COVID. Right. Or, sure. I mean, you couldn't ask for a worse recipe. But that gym has gotten through COVID, and right now, this is our first week of fall programming, and it's completely booming. I think every single recreational spot is filled. And I'll, I'll give you the background on it. This gym exists because my youngest son loves gymnastics and has his whole life. And in Victoria, Victoria is a fairly you know, large town thousand people more than that in greater Victoria, there wasn't a single gym that had a competitive boys gymnastics program. If you were a girl, you could compete. If you were a boy, you could participate in recreational gymnastics. If you wanted to sort of go up the food chain and compete against others, you couldn't do it. There was no gym that offered it. Long story short, after years of trying to figure out a way to make it happen, the only answer was opening our own gym. Uh, by by luck, uh, we crossed paths with somebody that came to Victoria hoping to open his own gym. And so all of us collaborated and we got this project off the ground. And I really, I really couldn't be prouder of my business partners and I couldn't be prouder of the coaches and I couldn't be prouder of the community for embracing the business as much as they have. So it's, uh, it's a great facility and I'm glad it's here. I'm glad it's thriving and I actually look forward to see where it goes in the years to come. You bet. And I bet as a, as a personal injury lawyer, that gives you a, a particular interest in risk management in a, with having a sports business. Yeah, well, safety is paramount, right? In, in gymnastics, like any physical activity, comes with a certain amount of risks. You can't do anything movement-related that doesn't have some risk of injury. And so, yeah, having well-trained coaches, having good procedures in place, following those procedures, making sure athletes progress in a sensible fashion, all of that's important. Now, as the injury lawyer, I can talk forever about it. I do not manage the business. I'm not involved in the hands-on day-to-day management of the business. There's really good business partners of mine that do that. They could probably talk at length about all the all the safety protocols they have, but all of our coaches are NCC certified and it's a operate facility. And so safety definitely is the name of the game, but you're right, as an injury lawyer, we can't help look at everything through the lens of, oh, you can get sued for that, you can get sued for that. There's liability all around us and, and you know, sports businesses aren't divorced from that reality. Paralegals either, trust me. Oh, I'm sure, yeah. <laughs> It, like, yeah, I, I could go on forever about 
oh my god what are you doing <laughs> i know you, you, you know? can't shut that switch off unfortunately once you're trained to see things that way that's just that's just the lens you see the world through yeah and it's good it's good for safety especially if you know if, number one if it's your business and number two if your kids make use of that business you want your children and everybody else's children to be really safe there oh yeah absolutely yeah actually speaking of regulatory matters my the i have a friend who is a, a regulator in aviation and he says you know sometimes people don't pay attention until there's a gaping hole in the ground with fire coming out of it and so you know i had other people uh, around me saying things like well you know lawyers will ma risk manage you to death and you'll never be able to get yourself off the ground but you know there is something to be said for starting as you mean to go so if you have a safety management system in place you know that's that's smart yeah, I think there's a happy mix there where, where there's probably some truth to the observation that if you got a bunch of lawyers together as business people, almost nothing would get moving because there'd be risk at every corner and, and things would be overthought. At the same time, there's a place for risk management and some sensible level of, of thinking about those kinds of issues because um, small oversights could become business transforming problems down the road so there is a place for it and there's also I, I fully get the case of over lawyering things to the point of not getting them off the ground in the first place so I actually have some I was reading your blog and um, I actually uh, wanted to know I noticed you're you're starting to write about um, the LE Act and and sort of the regulatory issues that are surrounding that. Can you tell me a little bit about that? I just so that I have a better understanding. Yeah, no, I'm happy, happy to bring you up the speed. So, so the Alley Act is federal legislation. I actually forget the technical titles, like the, the Boxing Safety Reform Act or something along those lines. There was two of them and they're just generally called the Alley Act. And these are reforms that came into professional boxing a few decades ago because there was a lot of mischief between promoters and managers. And so it basically gave us the structure that we're really familiar with today, which are sanctioning bodies, controlling titles. And then you can't have long-term contracts with your promoters and there's firewalls between promoters and managers. And, and the main thing it's achieved is elite boxers, uh, real top of the food chain. They've got significant leverage as free agents to negotiate big pace. So, so promoters are going to bid for the fighters for the services of top fighters and those top fighters are going to fight for the titles. And those top fighters could then command a huge percentage of revenues that are generated 60, 70, 80, sometimes north of that percent of the money that comes in. MMA comes along and it's not subject to the Alley Act. And so MMA, you have promoter controlled titles. So, so we'll talk UFC. The UFC controls their own heavyweight championship, their own welterweight championship. Who's the champ? Who fights for it? They decide. When can they strip the champ? They decide. Who's the next opponent? They decide. Well, if you're going to fight for that title, you're going to be under contract with the UFC. You can't be promoted by somebody else. And if you're going to fight for the title, you're going to want to make sure you're locked into a very long term contract so you don't win the strap and then maybe go off and get promoted by one of their competitors. And so what's happened over the years, whether it's right or wrong, there's an antitrust law so it's saying it's a whole lot of wrong, but the Alley Act itself does not apply. So there's not a violation of that legislation. And the landscape, it, it just speaks for itself, whether it's cause and effect or not, the lawyers are debating this, but landscape is the fighters take home 16, 17, 18 percent of the perks amongst the entire roster. The promoters get to pocket the rest, maybe 80 percent less, whatever their expenses are. You look at unionized sports and it's more of a 50-50 mix that gets collectively decided and a lot of that got fueled by antitrust litigation over the years. There's, there's lawsuits that forced a lot of these issues. In MMA, the fighters haven't done a very good job getting together forming a union. And so there's a great lawyer down in Arizona named Rob Maisie. And he's the brains behind 
the antitrust lawsuit against the UFC, that if it succeeds, it's going to cost them many, many billions of dollars, put a lot of money in fighters' pockets. He's also the lawyer behind the Alley Expansion Act. So he's formed a fighters association called the MMAFA, Mixed Martial Arts Fighters Association. And they've been lobbying Congress for years, trying to get the Alley Act for boxing banded to apply for mixed martial arts. And without sort of boring your listeners as to all of its nuances, the main thing it's going to do stop promoters from controlling their titles. It's going to stop there being long-term exploitative contracts for promoters, for fighters to compete for those titles. And it would make the sport uh, more in line with the boxing model where you're going to have independent titles and top of the food chain get to compete for those titles regardless of who they're promoted for. And the end result of all of that is it'll put a lot more money in the pockets of the elite mixed martial artists, which sort of comes full circle to what we talked about earlier in this in this recording, which is fighters could then negotiate good money for their services, and then they can choose to have much shorter careers while walking away with the, you know, the, you know, the financial ability to do so if they've helped generate enough money. If they've put the money in that pot and they can get a fair share and walk away, that's a good thing. And, and that's what the Alley Act, in short, would help achieve in mixed martial arts if it's brought in. There's a lot of hurdles um, for it to get there, but if it gets there, that'd be, that'd be a really game-changing bit of legislation for this work. So we've already talked about concussions and traumatic brain injury. Is there anything important to our conversation that you think I've missed or not not being critical of me. <laughs> I mean, is there something important that, that we've not touched on? Yeah, no, no, I've got nothing critical to say first off. I've, <laughs> I've enjoyed this conversation. Uh, no, I don't think so. You know, again, I, I appreciate you talking to a legal audience here, and it's not, you know, this isn't a mixed martial arts or a boxing podcast that, that I'm on, so I won't go too deep down any of these uh, topics. But but just for a quick understanding, no, I think, I think we've done a good job talking an injury is real and it's serious and it needs to be respected and people should be educated about those risks and there is a fair level of fighter exploitation and there are uh, people fighting to change some of these things i think you know those are those are you know good good topics for people to at least have a surface level of understanding if they dabble in these sports Right, right. I think you'd be surprised at the audience, actually. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, I always think it's just the legal audience, and then I'm always surprised at feedback. Yeah. It's kind of fun. So where can people find you if they want to get in touch with you about a car accident? Which reminds me, before I, you know, before we even go... Um, I would like, I'm hoping that you'll come back and talk to me about some of the ICBC enhanced care um, changes. Yeah, because, so, of, you know, we're seeing a lot of cases coming down recently that depending on what side of the fence you talk to, they're good or they're bad. So, uh, I, yeah, I don't see many good, that's for sure. And, and I'm happy to be back on. That's, that's its own, you know, podcast, I guess, is a standalone topic. I could I could rant and rave a lot about that. In a soundbite, though, the public was deceived, right? The, the government came and took everybody's rights away to make ICBT a lot more money. And they did it pretending ICBT is going to go belly up, but ICBT actually made $1.5 billion based on the cases they were handling that they were projected to lose all this money on. So it turns out no reform was needed at all. But the reform was the government taking all crash victims' rights away. And the public doesn't understand this. We're many months into this no-fault era. People don't understand that their rights are gone because the government, for a very slick and expensive ad campaign, called it enhanced care. So people were told, hey, if you're in a crash, your insurance is gonna be cheaper and you get more than they're smashed into by a drunk driver or a texting driver or whoever. And they learn, they get, not more, but far, far, far less. I'm talking 70, 80, 90% less than they did under the 
the system. So a lot of folks have been in for a rude awakening. I've been the bad guy who has to break this bad news to way too many crash victims since no fault came in. And I'm shocked at how many people are completely unaware of what their rights actually are right now. So if you have me back on, I'll rant and rave all about that. Happy, happy to bring your viewers up to speed on that. Excellent, excellent. I, lo I love a good fight. So you can run and rave as much as you want. So where can we find you online if, if we want to connect with you about either um, competitive sports or uh, about your personal injury practice? Yeah, so, so I probably spend way too much time on Twitter. So all, all my online handles are just my name, Eric McGregor. Uh, and then if you need to reach out to me directly or confidentially, if you go to the BC Injury Law Blog and fill out the form there, it'll send me a dis discreet email, so it'll come to me directly. And feel free to reach out to me with any confidential legal concerns there, or follow me on Twitter or any of my social media profiles. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciated this, this conversation. I loved it. Yeah. No, thank you for having me. My, my pleasure. Thank you.